Thank you very much, uh, Edward. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, be here today to celebrate Isabel's uh, 60th birthday. By the way, it's also Ramadros' 60th birthday. We don't sing happy birthday on my time. Uh, I can't think of a better way to celebrate Isabel's 60th anniversary than to have a good old argument amongst uh, all of us up here, all our friends on, on the uh, podium. I have six uh, lessons that I want to draw uh, from uh, a U.S. perspective, an American perspective, uh, uh, about the peace process that was and what it can mean for the peace process to, uh, uh, for the future. The first is that resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict is an American national interest. This is not often understood by Israelis. Uh, and it's not always understood by the United States, uh, by its leaders. But I think uh, what underscores this point is the fact that President Bush, after seven years of believing that uh, it wasn't important to work on peace in the Middle East, that it was better to promote democracy first, has come around uh, in his eighth year in office to understanding that this is an American national interest. He said it in an interview in the Jerusalem Post, I expect he'll say it tonight, Secretary of State Rice said it here in Jerusalem last December at the Sahara Forum. Um, and the fact that the Republican president who did everything to avoid this conclusion uh, now is arguing it, uh, I think uh, makes it clear that this is something that the United States considers as important to its national interest. And that will be true of whether it's President McCain, or President Clinton, or a President Obama. Those who counsel continuation of the status quo, my good friend uh, Yaakov, uh, should understand that that is not in the American national interest. Second, uh, second lesson is that we need, when the United States President decides to get involved in peacemaking in the Middle East, he needs capable leaders as partners who uh, have a sense of urgency about the need to resolve the conflict. When the United States had partners like Sadat and uh, Malcolm Begin, like uh, King Hussein and Yitzhak Rabin, uh, American presidents were able to make uh, peace uh, treaties between Israel and Egypt, Israel and Jordan, they were lasting uh, peace treaties. When we didn't have those kinds of leaders on the, on the Arab sides, in the case of Yasser Arafat, and uh, Hafiz al-Assad, uh, except in the last uh, six months of his life, uh, we weren't able to achieve uh, an end to the conflict. Now we have, on the Palestinian side, a divided polity and a leader who wants, but uh, can't. Uh, and on the Israeli side, well, I'll let you fill in the dots. Um, but uh, uh, it's a problem. Uh, there's only so much the United States can do absent uh, partners who are prepared to break the mold, who are prepared to take the risks for peace, who are prepared to have the courage to stand up to the inevitable opposition, uh, internal opposition, uh, and uh, who are prepared to there thereby uh, bring their people to peace. Um, the third lesson uh, is about settlements and, and security. Uh, my conclusion, I suspect Dan will share it with me, is that, that from an American perspective, Oslo, which by the way was an agreement negotiated by Ron and, uh, and others uh, behind the backs of the United States, notwithstanding what, what they might tell you now, it was not a, an agreement that we were party to. Uh, nevertheless, it was one that we embraced, but it was a, a, an agreement in which the uh, commitments of both sides were observed in the breach. And uh, that undermined confidence on uh, both sides in the uh, uh, value of, of making peace. Uh, and uh, one essential lesson in this regard is that the Palestinians must uh, end incitement and fight terror uh, effectively, and the Israelis must stop settlement activity. It is a commitment that this Israeli government has made, the previous Israeli government made, that there will be a freeze on all settlement activity, including natural growth. There is no freeze on settlement activity, including natural growth. And it is doing a real damage to the effort to try to reach an agreement now. Uh, the, uh, the fourth lesson is one of unintended consequences. What we discovered in the Clinton administration when we pushed on the Syrian track to try to achieve a Syrian deal first is that we, in fact, uh,
encouraged and enabled deals to be done on the Palestinian and Jordanian track, which was not our intention at all. When the United States pushes on one door in the Middle East, it often discovers that another door will open up. The point here is that we need uh, negotiations to proceed on all tracks. And I think it is a mistake that there is no Israeli-Syrian negotiation as part of the broader Arab-Israeli process. The fact that both the Israeli government and the Syrian government want to engage in peace talks and that the United States has never before stood back uh, when uh, Israel wanted to engage in Arab party in peace talks and the Arab party wanted to do so as well. This is a fundamental mistake that should not be repeated in the future that we can benefit and Israel can benefit from the synergy created by the two tracks, but instead of pushing on the Syrian track now, as a Syria first policy, uh, I believe that the urgency is on the Palestinian track, but a process with the Syrians can help that track move forward uh, quite dramatically. Uh, the, since my time is up, I will abbreviate my last two lessons. One, uh, the fifth one is that there is an important role for international forces in this process essentially because the Palestinians do not have the capability to live up to their commitments and uh, without an in international forces to partner them, uh, this process uh, will really go nowhere. The Israelis will not have confidence in uh, the Palestinian willingness to fulfill their commitments. We'll end up with a shelf agreement, which is what they're talking about now, and the shelf agreement is what we saw before in Oslo that didn't get implemented, it will be a mistake for both sides. Final point for the United States is the hand over to the next administration. We in the Clinton administration did that very poorly. We handed over a process that had collapsed. The territories were in flames with the Second Intifada, and uh, Bill Clinton left the White House warning George Bush, don't you ever trust that son of a bitch, yes, sir, if only betrayed me and he'll betray you. Uh, rather than try to uh, achieve a peace treaty by the end of this president's term in office. I mean, it would be nice if it can be achieved, but I wonder if there's anybody in the audience or on the podium who believes that it can be achieved. If it cannot be achieved, then it's very important that the administration, the president, hand over the peace process in good working order to the next president so that he or she can pick it up and move it forward quickly because time is not on the side of peacemaking.